making popcorn? Uh huh. I only eat popcorn at the movies. Well, I'm getting ready to watch a video. Really? What? Oh, just some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Hello, friends. Here we are for our latest episode of the Hollywood Gold Podcast. I'm your host, Daniela Taplin Lundberg, and I'm here with my right hand, Becca Camerata, also my head of production at Say Gold Features. Hey, Bex. Hi. I'm very excited about this week's episode. We're about to dive into the history of Scream. I'm very excited to hear about the process of making this because this was such a different time in in filmmaking than than we're in right now and so it were just totally different rules and i i do know that there was kind of a lack of horror films this movie really reinvented the genre it brought horror films back into the mainstream but also did so in such an accessible way. The movie, I remember, was also as funny as it was scary. And the script was so tight and clever. And I loved the movie. And I wasn't a horror film goer. I mean, I guess I watched them when I was like in fourth grade at sleepovers. But, but I'm not a huge fan. And so, so this movie really changed that for me. And we're interviewing Kathy Conrad, who is the lead producer on the film, and is such a badass in her own right. Bex, have you noticed we've been interviewing a lot of amazingly badass female producers? Yes, and it makes me so happy. I think it's going to surprise people how many women produced some of these classic movies. I think if you ask a person on the street who produced Scream, I don't think they would ever think a woman produced this movie. And so I'm very excited we're highlighting a lot of these incredible female producers who who did kind of pave the way for us. <laughs> yeah, she really did. I mean, Kathy produced Scream, but she also produced movies like Girl Interrupted and Copland and Walk the Line. And I mean, she's done it all. So she really, nothing scares Kathy. And I think, I hope that she's able to tell us some great stories of like, you know, staring down the barrel of the Weinsteins and just like not flinching because I think I've, I've read about that and I'm, I'm very excited to hear it from her mouth. So uh, let's let's kick it off. Kathy Conrad, my friend, one of um, my producing idols, you've produced some of my favorite films and you are kind enough to talk about one of your most successful films, although you've had many. Today, we're going to talk about Scream. So when did you first hear about it and what prompted you to read it? So Scream, a.k.a. cover page of script called Scary Movie, landed on my desk with very little explanation as to what it was or what it wasn't. It wasn't like, oh, you know, this is meant to be this. It's a post mod it, it didn't have any description. It was okay. just Kevin Williamson was a writer that I was tracking. I had been working previously in my previous pre-producerial life for a director, Norman Jewison, and mm. and I kind of used Norman as a magnet to kind of lure in and read and meet and acquaint myself with some of the fresh voices kind of emerging and popping. And Kevin was in the pack. You know, okay. I had read something that he had written earlier, his first script called Killing Mrs. Tingle. And right. you know, I really loved I really loved the way that he sort of spoke with his characters and they were so young and fresh and fun. This came to me through his agent, Justin Dardis at the time. And I remember taking the script home specifically uh, and reading it. I lived in Nichols Canyon at the time. For anybody that's not in uh, a, a California native, that's kind of you know, a community like way up a hill. Uh And uh, it was, I remember sitting in my, in my living room, reading it at night, of course, and clocking out the window consistently like, oh, this is really, (laughs) this was such a visceral, I was like scared. I was like super, I was like, holy crap. Like, I don't have any curtains. Why don't I have any curtains? Why am I reading this at night? What am I even doing? And I, you know, I remember cut forward, you know, I, the script landed, I read it, I loved it. Um, You know, I was involved in a deal that had a deal uh, inside Miramax uh, Hollywood Pictures at the time. And I remember calling Bob Weinstein's office and saying that this was something that I thought that we should get into. And obviously, after communicating with the agent, and there were several really avid genre 
horror buff fans that sat at Bob's desk, you know, Richard Potter, Andrew Rona, and they read it very quickly as well. And we all kind of jumped on this and said we should get involved. So Kathy, and, let me just stop you yeah. right there. Was it a spec script that was like sent out on a yeah. Friday? Like it was it one of those situations where it's like everyone's reading it? The script was sent as a spec script, as was customary at that time. But, you know, it didn't have like a lot of that heat around it. You know, the mm -hmm. way that people went out, it was very much the time and the place at that market in Hollywood of just trying to get competitive offers. And especially the agent that went out with it, Justin, was kind of known in the community as somebody that really ignited big, huge spec sales. You know, I mean, okay. he was the guy that kind of like took your deal and then shopped it, even though he said he wouldn't. And mm -hmm, then, mm -hmm. you know, made it really competitive and made your life really hard for whoever you were working with because you thought you had it and you felt special. And then you realized 37 other people got it and then it was a thing. And then, you know, so yeah, it was yeah, always, yeah. it was always this moment of like, wait, this is really good. Who else is reading it? And no one ever told you. So you had to kind of like really move at a pace that you felt was appropriate for what you were reading and responding to. And I will say that this was, you know, something that Miramax was good at in that particular moment in time, which is just that because they were their own animals, so to speak, they could kind of move on things quickly. And Bob read it and liked it. Of course, it turned into a thing. It turned into that, like, oh, he's wait and no, and it needs to be higher, and you have to pay more, and you know, mm -hmm. you thought you were getting something, and you were just always being manipulated. So, like, but, who was competing with you yeah. guys? Like, what other studios, or was it all sort of smoke and mirrors? It was a little bit of both. There was really only three companies, and to be honest with you, I can't remember a hundred percent. There was a couple of indie studios that were looking at it, and there wasn't anybody in the bigger arena of the studio systems at that time that thought that this was a sure thing. And right. obviously, we won the day. And it was also very exciting. And I think what was the most exciting that I think Miramax Dimension recognized with this material, which I recognized as a producer, which is rare for anybody that reads scripts quite a bit, is that if I wanted to do absolutely nothing, I could have gone out and shot that movie that Kevin wrote that right. day and right. made a great movie because it was so perfectly crafted with so much because you know I love to read and I read a lot of scripts and, and I read a lot of great writers and usually the things that I respond to are really quite well done mm -hmm. but there's always something that needs to be done and it's not to say that we didn't do anything to this script but it was in really 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 good shape. That made it very exciting. You weren't known for genre. Like that was sort no. of felt outside of your like sort of, you know, your Sweet taste. Yeah. And so what yeah. was it that you were like, oh, and it also felt like that felt very novel at the time. Like just that sort of reinventing that horror genre. That wasn't happening a lot. Honestly, I didn't think I was reinventing anything. Yeah. I didn't think, that, you know, all the language around Scream came after people put on it what they mm -hmm. then saw it to be. It's not right. like somebody read this and said, oh, wow, this is postmodern in a new voice right. and let's reinvent horror. No one was making this anymore. Hollywood had sort of decided by majority of whoever decides these things that that cycle had sort of come and gone and now we need to do these. And so the success of this, which I always love when this happens, is it sort of happened when nobody was looking. And then right. suddenly everybody decided, whoa, we didn't know that there was this market out here. We didn't know there was this audience appetite and this demographic that really was hungry for something like this. So, and for me, you're right, it wouldn't look like this script on the outside with the wrapping paper that it's in would be something that I would spark to. But I grew up on these movies, you right, know, I mean, right. and I've always loved genre, but I loved the characters. I loved what, you know, the mm -hmm. ensemble. And if you really look at a lot of the things that I love, it's not always just a story of one. It's a story of some, of many, mm -hmm. and kind of the influence of just sort of an ensemble cast on the narrative. And I always loved the kind of, it could be you, it could, you know, Agatha Christie and, yeah. you know, growing up with Patricia Highsmith and just the whodunit of it all has always been a fun story that I like to dive into. Was Dimension fully formed at that point? Dimension was the the kind of the stepchild of Miramax, you know. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that Bob Weinstein, if you heard me say that, would be very... <laughs> 
But I mean, Bob very much was a devotee of the genre. I mean, he mm -hmm. loved that. And he was, you know, Harvey was just always over here with the piano and Shalot yeah, yeah. <laughs> looking for that. And Bob could have cared less about, you know, an Oscar. He just right. wanted to make movies that had a bigger appeal, a genre element to it. That was his sandbox that he liked to play in. Okay, yeah. so it didn't take too much convincing for him. He was on the page. He was like, yeah, this is great. Let's do this. Yeah, Miramax and Dimension at that time, specifically the wild, wild west that it was, was formed and unformed always at the same time. It was sort of these two things clashing. And the one thing, though, that they had taken an active interest in, and I think what was appealing to Bob at the time was the new filmmaker element or the new voice element or, you mm -hmm. know, just that mm -hmm. idea that this was something fresh he had taken an active interest in like Oli Bornadel. They were doing a night watch. Uh, they were always trying to find that next leading somebody because they were a younger studio, a smaller studio, and they couldn't really competitively compete at that particular moment in time with the price point to get in with people. So that's how their advocacy for people like Rodriguez and Quentin and right. Gary Fleeter and many other filmmakers and Guillermo even yeah. began to kind of bloom. And that's kind of, I think, again, Bob was looking for things to make right away. They weren't necessarily in the deep development game, so they really wanted something to start really cementing the brand. Never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back, because you won't be back. I'm getting another beer. You want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back. Oh! You know, if I was wrong about Cotton Weary, then the killer's still out there. The duck other said, you're starting to sound like some West Carpenter flick or something. So you guys win the day on the script, and then what happens? How do you start putting it together? Well, it was interesting. So we win the day, and then, of course, um, you know, there were the internal conversations about filmmakers. And it's very hard now for many to look back and say, that it wasn't always Wes, but it wasn't always Wes. Like right, right. further to what I was just saying that the idea of finding that new voice, who's that up and comer right. that can take the up and coming voice of this writer, Kevin Williamson, and really put cinema language to kind mm -hmm. of what was on the page here. And so that became a little bit of a deeper dive. And there were several people that we were looking at, you know, one of them was Anthony Waller, who had just made a movie called Mute Witness. He was from the UK. Mm -hmm. it just people that were less established. Wes's name came up from, from Wes Craven, Bob, actually. the father of Wes Craven. Yeah. And to be perfectly honest, I mean, Wes knew this. I think all of us knew this, which is just Kevin and I and others at that time, we were kind of like, we love Wes. I mean, he's a master, of course, but weren't we trying to make this fresh, new... Right, right package of something like is, new. is that the freshest we can come up with i mean at that time i had a lot of relationships with young emerging filmmakers a lot of them had deals at miramax it was an exciting time in my career to think that we could be part of something that felt like we were excluded from i mean the generation before us they all had their cemented relationships we were all looking to kind of mm -hmm. have a voice here and so it's not to say that we were like oh gosh Really? Right. That, yeah. But but we were also going, <laughs> really? I don't know. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, I love those movies. I mean, I yeah. grew up on them, but really? Like, I don't think, I think we kind of hit, we were just sort of like, we weren't sure first. Yeah. And um, obviously it turned out to be the best thing. And Wes wasn't sure. I mean, I'll be fair to him. He was like, yeah. thanks, but no. So what was fun about this again was that we were pushing away his classicism and he was pushing away doing more horror. He was like, I want to be taken... You know, I think everybody, if you're branded of sorts, always has a moment in your career where you'd like to stretch out a little bit and say, can I do something else? Like, haven't I done this enough times? Like, why do I have to do this again? You know? Right, right. And I think that Wes was such a deeply thoughtful, incredible person that you wouldn't expect, like I didn't expect him, the person that I came to know from his work because mm -hmm. he it's just different. And he's really complicated and really complex and deep. And there's a tremendous psychology that he brought to the table about 
how characters interact with their environment and circumstances when they're in these insane situations and the cathartic what is cathartic about these movies? Yeah. It's like, I never thought about that when I used to go to the cinema and scream my head off that I'm actually, you know, totally. purging. Like, I, I never really, I wasn't a student of film on that level. I'm mm -hmm. more of a let me feel something and can I relate to you? And it was all, has to be very visceral, tangible. I got to feel it. I'm not going to theorize about it. So Wes kind of, he was quiet. He was dignified. You know, we were all these young people going, yeah, you know, yeah. like we would have, it's got to be this and it's got to that, and, you know, camera's always moving. And, you know, and right. Wes is like composed and, right, and, right, and we're right. like, how's this going to work? Like, how's this going to work? And of course, you know, it did. <laughs> so you hire him after some pushing and pulling. What finally convinced him, do you think? Like, why did he decide to sort of dive back into it? Genre. Well, I think, you know, once everybody got to meet everybody and everybody kind of put down a little bit about whatever they thought somebody was or wasn't, and Kevin and Wes started talking, I think there was a great synergy there. I think that Bob was establishing a brand, and if this was going to be this kind of movie, the brand name for this kind of movie is Wes Craven. Right. And he wouldn't have to work as hard to establish mm. a core audience and a fan following for something. And again, I go back to this idea that the humor in this was so unique mm. and it brought to the genre something that people hadn't experienced and that's that postmodern bit. But what we thought was cool was we thought that's what you sell because we were trying to come at it from this place of, this isn't what you think. Right. And Bob was trying to say, this is exactly what you think this is. And his whole goal was to get the people that were so confident in knowing what they wanted that they would drive the audience yeah. and drive the participation and they would be the spokespeople to say, I'm telling you, it's not what you think. So for all of you that don't go to these movies right, because right. you're afraid of them, right. this is the one you should go to. It was very smart in that way. So you've got your your director now, the cast, which is so smart. And I just remember thinking everyone was so perfectly cast. And talk about anything you remember. My partner at the time was Carrie Woods, and we were talking about who would play Sydney and Drew Barrymore's. You know, because we were kind of two trains running, like who would be a great actress for Sydney Prescott because she obviously was the lead. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking with Drew's manager an agent at the time. And it was actually Drew who had this kind of novel idea to die and, mm. you know, play Casey, which was just like, you know, again, when you go back in time and think about this, and part of it was because she was very busy at the time and we really loved her and we really wanted her to be in the movie. But, you know, it was sort of inspired genius on her part to totally. say, how can I be part of this? And also narratively freak people out. Like people will think it's about me, but it's not. Right. And again, I think that when you're older and you can look back in time and you can see the success of something, it looks like everybody had it all figured out. Right. But I think no one knew how any of this was going to work. It just sounded like a good idea at the time. Totally, <laughs> so, like happy accident. So why so not? Yeah, yeah, why not? And um, obviously once we kind of had this idea of Drew, and again, budget and expectation play into this these, these kind of ideas. And I think that there's a standard in these kind of movies is this idea that you're you're not necessarily familiar with these people. You divide them up in such a way that each one of them represents a piece of you know, a potential someone watching the movies. We can see the girl next door in Sydney Prescott. We can see the kind of, you know, more outwardly sexy and vivacious character yeah. and know she's going to die at some point right. in like Rose McGowan. Yeah. And everyone in this movie, other than Courtney Cox and David Arquette to a certain extent, were pretty fresh. I mean, obviously people knew Nev from her television work, but she really wasn't established in film at all. Mm -hmm. And but and she really did have the per she was the perfect kind of package for all the emotional angst and internal, you know, stoicism that Sydney was holding on to based on her past history. And Skeet 
was an up and comer kind of cute yeah. guy and same with Lillard and Jamie Kennedy and mm -hmm. you know they each one of them it's kind of like like Wizard of Oz is always the paradigm for every movie you know what right. I'm saying for me it's like right. it's oh, like so so, so you have mm -hmm. you know each one of these characters is somebody that has to be something to somebody and mean mm -hmm. something to somebody mm -hmm. as our people journey on the road to where they're getting so each piece of each one of these characters kind of becomes kind of a whole it represents the whole concept and they all were fun and young and fresh and in an age where we didn't have instagram and influencer numbers and yeah. you know oh she's got a big audience it was a little bit more of a fun casting process because it was actually a casting process like people came in and auditioned right. and it wasn't like oh let's put him in it because yeah, we got an opportunity to like sit there and see Jamie Kennedy play with his voices and do the funny thing that Randy would do. And right. is he a film geek? And and I think that, you know, the hardest get was Courtney. You know, mm. I mean, that was like convincing somebody who was a pretty iconic star at that time to be in this kind of movie, which was not something that she was had ever said, oh, this is on my wish list and I want to do that. Right. So she was a little bit more of a courting process. And I remember we had our lunch at, at the Polo Lounge, sure. uh -huh. you know, um, which was really, yeah, which was really fun. And she wanted to meet Wes and it was all, it was fun, the idea of her as this kind of, you know, mouthy Gail Weathers. And yeah, she her, her agreeing to do this was really exciting. And she had come thinking a lot about that character uh, mm -hmm. to that lunch and even had these ideas at the time about her hair like because mm. it was all about hair back then right like <laughs> let's be clear like you know I remember when I was casting another movie of mine things to do in Denver when you're dead I remember Andy Garcia saying it's all about shoes yeah. you know it's like everything's about shoes like I have to find my shoes first because before anything else like I don't even talk to me about clothes I need need the shoes like That's so right each here. one of these got it you know, yeah. each one of these yeah. people have a, a process and yeah. um, Courtney was just, it was like a lot about the hair and the neon and uh -huh. the kind of in your face reporter sh short uh, power suits and yeah yeah Such and the power suit and the kind yeah. of like almost like it's like a weather woman no one takes me seriously and i'm going to be so serious and i'm going to tell you why right and the shoulder pads the whole thing which was you know obviously very different than monica on yeah. <laughs> friends and i remember going to the hair salon with marianne madalena who was another producer on it and chris mcmillan had a salon i think it was uh, i don't know it was a, a stilo or something it used to be on melrose and it was this big moment of like you know uh -huh. we're gonna do these frosted yes. tips and yeah. stuff and, yeah and of course i was like wow i mean it was just it's fun to go back in time and think about it because it was a really you know it was a very exaggerated and bold choice you know on a lot of levels on her part um yeah I think she just wanted to really dump into that idea of that kind of character and really she really her. holds up too. I mean, I thought she was so oh so totally great yeah and, and actually yeah. like rather complicated. <laughs> An innocent man on death row, a killer still on the loose. Kenny, tell me I'm dreaming. You want to go live? No, no, no. If I'm right about this. I could save a man's life. Do you know what that could do for my book sales? Citywide curfew beginning at nine o'clock tonight. Okay, so you you're cast up. Where are you prepping? Where are you shooting? Well, that was it. You know, we wanted this to feel. Wes really wanted there to feel like sort of this idyllic East Coast town was initially what everybody was thinking about. You know, this idea of hills and green and beautiful scenery and imagery and not palm trees, not any of that kind of stuff. And the conversation kind of led to Northern California where it felt small little hamlet town with seemingly not a lot going on. And obviously as the film progresses, there was a lot of sin and sex going on underneath the small, small town hood yeah. for everybody. Yeah. There's just a lot of misbehaving. I think that's the fun part about these movies too, is that you get an audience comfortable with the serenity of some place and then you just kind of shred it yeah. <laughs> to pieces. Yeah. So what town yeah. was that? I mean, it really was so 
beautiful. We were based out of Santa Rosa, California, okay. which is kind of 45 to 50 minutes outside of an area that everybody knows more uh, more by name, which is Sonoma and Napa and Heidelsburg, uh, okay. that whole area of kind of, you know, wine country or more of an agricultural kind of feel up there. But it's, um, we were based in Santa Rosa and we stayed at the Double Tree in Santa Rosa. You know, again, we were 20 and change, $23 million movie, which really wasn't a lot, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we had to cover everything and we sort of treated it, it was a little bit like summer camp, to be honest with you, because yeah. somehow, and that was what was so much fun about this cast, which is everybody, including Courtney and including Drew, you know, everybody wanted to be together. And it was like whole ways of just chaos and fun. You know, everybody kind of, we worked together, we played together and, it just felt easy, you know, on yeah. that level. Nobody was a prima donna. Nobody asked for extraordinary things. In fact, if they did get it, they kind of gave it away. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. was just sort of like, let's just go do this thing. Talk about the first days of shooting. And I know there was like a few bumps before it like settled into a smooth, smoother ride. Um, yeah, so, you could say that. <laughs> Give me the scoop. It's kind of a fabled, notorious story now. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, depending on who you speak to, you'll probably get a different version. But given that I was the one that was getting the early morning phone calls from Bob at 4 a.m., obviously, for those that don't know, you know, Miramax was based in New York. We were shooting in California that may, you know, it was always an early morning on a film set. But, you know, when we had designed because of Drew's schedule to actually shoot in order, which is to shoot Casey Becker's demise. And that's, the, you know, the first seven pages of the script. And obviously it was critical. It establishes ghost face. It establishes the mask. It establishes the tone, kind of the whole idea of it the idea of the scary movie and ghost face and the voice and the game of the movie. So we had a week with Drew and that was it. And then she was gone. So we had a tight schedule and we had been filming for a couple days and the calls started coming from Bob, which were, you know, really intense. And he was saying that he hated them. He did not like the mask. He never approved the mask. And when I say the mask, I mean ghost face. I mean, yeah. the most iconic mask yeah. that you could recall now. It's hard to believe that that mask suddenly was under so much scrutiny. And not only was the mask under scrutiny, but so was Wes's directing. And mm. Bob was having a very difficult time understanding how anything that he was seeing in daily form. Um, and again, going back in time, you know, this was still back in the time when you had to process film and screen the film and see it on a projector. Mm -hmm. And so there was a delay. And so he was greatly concerned that what he was seeing wasn't good and he didn't like it and it didn't feel scary to him. It didn't feel fresh. Nothing felt scary. And in fact, it was so bad in his opinion that he was dispatching the president of his company to course correct us. Oh um, and that person was a friend of mine, actually, Carrie Granite, who was the president of Dimension at the time. And, um, you know, I, of course, as a producer, was really frustrated because everybody's heard the stories about Miramax and Dimension and the interference and the kind of the amount of micromanaging that can happen. And I had sort of felt like we had bypassed a lot of that and we were kind of on the road to kind of be, and that was also part of the beauty, by the way, of shooting on the West Coast and being far away from <laughs> New so York City. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. you know, you never knew when suddenly like, you know, a car would pull up and there was Harvey or Bob on your yeah. film set, you know, in the middle of the night to kind of upend things uh, with, you know. So, so, you know, we had sort of felt like we had scored a victory and we were far, far away from all of that. And then yet here comes the war. Yeah. So, of course, we never would have proceeded, in our opinion, with a mask that is a hero prop in a film without getting approval. How it slipped past everybody's, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> idea, still a mystery to this day. But Carrie came out to Santa Rosa with a suitcase and suggestions from Bob of four other kinds, oh my God. four other masks, and with the mandate that we needed to reshoot all the scenes that we had already shot with so each shot version. A week already. Yeah, we had shot like five, yeah, yeah, okay. over a week. Okay. And um, we had to redo 
each scene. We had to redo, we had to shoot film and each scene or the scene that we're shooting this next day with each of these masks. And then Bob would look at it and decide which one Stop. he liked. Stop. And then we would do it again. And we were all like, what? Like, this doesn't even make any sense. Like, so we're gonna go tell actors that, okay, here's a gorilla mask and here's a lion oh face God. and here's a thing, like whatever it is. And, and it was just so insanely crazy. And um, so I said to Carrie that I really don't want any part of this and this is crazy and you can talk to Wes about it because I'm tired of going to Wes and telling him that you guys aren't happy. And, and so yeah. at that particular moment in time, you know, the studio was really pushing on Wes because like I said, not only did they not feel the mask was scary, but they were not happy with the footage. They, they could not in their mind's eye see how some of the ways that Wes was choosing to shoot this. And I think I mentioned before that what makes Wes so interesting, especially with this kind of material is, is you know, he was very classic with, right. with his shot. He was very composed. Mm -hmm. And I think that this was that moment, you know, the 90s when everybody was like steady cam and everything's totally. steady cam and, yeah. and everything's like shaking and You're moving, moving. And, yeah. and this is the new world order and we're yeah. not on sticks and we're yeah. in a car and we're bouncing. Yeah. And that makes everybody feel, and you know, this was just very, you know, Classic. and yeah. and uh, and I think it really threw them. They couldn't see how it was going to build. And so Carrie took Wes out to dinner. Marianne, Madalena, myself and Stuart Besser, our line producer, did not want to participate in that. And I think Carrie wanted a moment with Wes to try to reason with him. And then all I remember was obviously being very nervous about what was happening at that dinner. And then probably I fell asleep because the next thing I remember was around 11 o'clock, my phone ringing in my hotel room. And I picked up the phone and on the other end of the phone, the voice said, Hello, Kathy. Do you like scary movies? Oh, and I'm God. like, oh fuck, are oh, you kidding God. me? Like, <laughs> who? Like, is this some kind of like this? What's no one had the joke yet, like because it hadn't <laughs> even come out. Of course, now everybody does that to everybody at some point in their yeah, life. But yeah. at then, I was like, well, oh, oh come on, God. who is this? Is, yeah. It has to be Jamie. Yeah. And he goes, this is Wes Craven, your director. Could you please come to room <laughs> blah blah, you know, three forty three for a meeting? And oh, I'm like, God, and then he hung up, oh, and I'm like, God. what? And then. I called Marianne and Marianne had called Stuart and we were all called and we all went to this room. And Marianne in this room is, is um, Wes's, Wes's produce. producing partner. Okay, good. There we were with Wes and Carrie Granite in this hotel room where it was being presented to us a little bit more insistently that something big had to change here and that Bob's not happy. Oh, and so, you know, no one ever really ever had ideas back then, you know, when all we knew is that just Bob wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. And so what was being put to us as ideas of how to solve Bob's happiness was kind of insane. I mean, it just sort of meant that we had to shut down and start all over again until Bob was happy. And we're like, oh my no, God. like, yeah. we're not going to shut down. I mean, we're like, yeah. shoot it. You know, what do you yeah. even mean? Yeah. So it was like very nerve wracking. And I, you know, having worked with them before and kind of really trying to advocate always for my filmmakers, sometimes, especially back in that time, the brothers could be very bullying, you know? And I think as a producer, sometimes you had to kind of fight fire with fire, you right. know? And so the way, right. that it, the way that it worked, it wasn't political. And I'm sure I could say things differently now if I had the opportunity, but I was sort of like more of a reincarnated truck driver in moments like that. And I was just <laughs> like, I was more like a teamster than a, than a producer. And I was like, fuck you, go ahead, yeah. you know, shut us down. We don't care because right. we're not doing this. Right. I mean, you know, that really wasn't probably, you know, the best thing that you could ever <laughs> do for your career. But it, you know, those guys, you know, yeah. it was difficult sometimes. So how do you make a point? And yeah. Wes was really hurt by right. the scrutiny and the lack of confidence. And I think it was really hard as a producer to sit there and look at him, right. you know, being told how he has to do something different when you really, at that point in the process, you really want to trust your director and yeah. trust what they're bringing because they are the vision, right? right? And when you sign up with them, you're signing up for that. And at a certain point, you have to let go and you have to let them right. do what they're doing. So I had this idea that because the premise was nothing's scary, the mask isn't scary. The footage isn't scary. Nothing's scary. Mm -hmm. And so 
I sort of, the idea came to pass of like, well, okay, let us prove to you that this is scary and then you will leave us alone. And what I think that you should do is to get off our back, will you let, and Patrick Lussier, who was um, Wes's editor on several films and, mm-hmm. and really a great guy and, and smart and, and really good with music too, mm-hmm. let us cut together the footage that we have, which isn't much, but at least we have enough of the sequence with Drew Barrymore that we can show you that yeah. this works. And so the idea was embraced and we, in very short order, in less than 38 hours or so, oh Patrick had assembled because again, we were cutting on location and doing stuff to get, you know, like that. So And you were it was shooting a, it was on an, film, right, Kathy? Yeah. Like nothing was mm-hmm, digitized. Mm-hmm, it was mm-hmm. like you were like yeah. cutting the film together. And putting it all together and doing music and all that kind oh of stuff. God. So, you know, we then sent this to New York and... You know, I remember this day too, which was, I don't remember every moment in time, but I do remember standing outside the area that we were shooting and talking to the projectionist in Tribeca. And so I had obviously made several movies with Bob and Harvey and kind of the way that, you know, there was a screening room at Miramax and obviously the projectionist and Richard Potter and people from Bob's office were kind of on hand. And cell phones we had them but that wasn't like how it is now and Mm -hmm. you know you couldn't so you were it was almost like telephone operator i was relying on what people were telling me was happening in real time in new york while we're filming while everyone keeps coming to me going have you heard have you heard have you heard anything like and i'm like no i don't know and and then you know everybody's like oh my god and it was just always like this you know oh my god (laughs) when is he gonna watch it and and then this moment of like four minutes of like, okay, the, the, the film's in the projector. Okay. Oh uh, you God. know, uh, Bob's coming in. Okay. Oh, okay. Bob sit down. Harvey's here. Yeah. Harvey lit a cigarette. Harvey's yeah. smoking. They're talking. Okay. Okay. It's dark. They're turning it on. Okay. <laughs> hold on. And then you're just sitting there because, you know, you know, oh they're God. watching it. And then, and then it's, I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? It's okay. <laughs> you know, and they're like, um, I think they like it. I mean, then the lights come on and Harvey's like, fuck that, you know, that's amazing. And, (laughs) you know, and then, and then it was like so weird because like literally 15 minutes later, my phone rang and it was Bob Mm -hmm. and Bob said, all he said was, you know, you were right and I was wrong. (laughs) And, uh, I always remember him saying that because it's like, first of all, those guys never usually admitted that they were wrong about anything. And he was very clear. It was like, you were right and I was wrong and you guys can keep going. So bye. And that was that, <laughs> you know, and then he called Wes and, and then that was it. It was kind of like, right. Right. Whew, right. Oh my God. It was like such a big right. relief to oh my have God, that a story. Um, blow past you. I mean, it was just so much stress thinking about it at that time and kind of what the consequences were for kind of how we were trying to do this. But the reason it was so threatening was because, you know, at that point people had heard and it was true that there was a lot of, because Bob and Harvey held the purse strings and had a lot of power, they could just shut you down. Right. They could just decide we're not doing this anymore and, 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 and let it go. And, and that was kind of like, it was so fragile sometimes, you know, trying to dance the line between supporting what you're trying to make creatively and trying to broker with these yeah. uh, very emotional, reactive people that just kind of land in the middle of a process where, right. you know, and blow it up and don't care that right. it costs more. <laughs> like well, it's, that's like it's- truly why you are one of my idols. Like the, the balls it took for you to stand. <laughs> To stand up against the brothers, like at that time, is incredible. I mean, it really, that's like great, great producing. So I just, I love that story so much. And I I think Mm. that often in, in moments of trauma. Surprise, Sydney. What's the matter, Sydney? You look like you've seen a ghost. I had read somewhere that the character who played the voice was sort of kept separated Roger, yeah. and yeah. and like to create sort of extra trauma for the cast and create real fear. Like, tell me about that. This is again where Wes is sort of genius, which is just that it's scary when you don't know where something's coming from. Mm-hmm. And yet automatically your senses are heightened. And I think that every director works with their actors differently. But the idea that there is this person who is unknown 
that can see you and you can't see them and they know you and you don't know them like how do you metabolize that idea as an actor and react to that mm -hmm. and so Wes really obviously we knew the voice had to be altered and there was a voice component to this mechanically but you know that was really Wes's idea that this person would be with us but never known to the actors even though as an actor you know this is going to happen to you right. I think the experience of how it happens to you really was heightened by the idea that they didn't ever really get access to that right you know, so um, did they on, literally not meet that actor or, or was he no, just sort of not for a while no yeah okay. he was off in another part of the world so yeah clever so clever. Yeah. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. Wes Craven, what a genius. Yeah, and Wes, you know, I mean, what's interesting is that the hard knocks that I described earlier about what Wes went through emotionally with this experience with Bob, because his other pictures had been at New Line, and it was that independent kind of idea, but there was more, it seemed, I wasn't, I didn't participate in those, but there seemed to be a little bit more camaraderie or belief that he could do what he does and Freddie, you know, I mean, yeah. they had had a lot of success with them. So the fact that Bob was challenging this filmmaker at this point in his career inside the genre of his expertise was really difficult and hard for Wes. And, you know, we were just, again, it was all of this judgment about what we are, or what we were, what we weren't mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. on behind the scenes. We right. aren't scary enough. We're too scary. We're not this, we're not that, the, yeah. you know, it, it, so it was a very interesting push-pull. And so it was smooth sailing once we got past Bob and once we got past the external world of editorializing and projection and got to finish our film. But then we had an equal challenge with the ratings board right. um, about blood. Yeah. So yeah. every step of the way, you know, when you look at this little movie that nobody was looking at, suddenly somehow everybody was looking at parts of it mm -hmm. and deconstructing it without seeing the big picture, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, what's acceptable and what's not and how many seconds of blood can you actually see and how long can you hold on this shot and how many times can, and it was just really, uh, it, was just, it was an education process for me because like you said, it's like, I don't make these movies, you know, right, I've never right. made these kinds of movies before. I've certainly, you know, made movies where there's violence and there's guns and language, but I'd never made something where the actual component of blood was measured <laughs> so as a Kathy, metric. Explain to the average viewer. So you've put together your cut. It's pretty much what Wes is happy with, the studio is happy with, and you submit it to the MPA that gives it a rating. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you'd, you'd submitted it, and what, what came back when you first submitted it? Oh, uh, you could just, it's... Like it NC-17 sort of like, or like just... Not. Like NO, like yeah, this yeah, is... No. You can't, yeah. we're, we're not, you, you can't do this. You know, then you get into the negotiation. It's almost like working with a lobbyist in Washington. They give you a list of all the things that bothers them, and then you have yeah. to kind of look at the list... It went from the extreme to the negotiated to the measure to the, you know, so it's like, you know, I mean, the one thing a director, especially of Wes's stature, that I know that he was hoping for that hadn't been part of this process really from the beginning was just the confidence that he knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He had been through these kinds of battles before because this genre is what he does. So I think the one good thing about Harvey and Bob's kind of bullying tactics at times was that they weren't afraid of confrontation. They weren't afraid of somebody challenging them. I mean, they obviously needed the goods to market their movie and they knew that they wanted a rating on this that wasn't going to prevent them from making money. So it was yeah. important for them to get some rating that allowed, you know, they needed their an audience. R. They needed an R, right? We needed an R. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we didn't even yeah. get an R. <laughs> the yeah. Then became the amount of shots and then they actually make suggestions, you know, they make cuts and suggestions about what would work for them. And then you have to kind of, again, metabolize the insane idea of that and what it right. would do to the film as a whole. And then right. you have to broker that with the studio and kind of go through that whole process to kind of win. Did Wes ever the lose his cool through all of these sort of highs and lows? Well, I mean, we all lost it. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. there were many... Um, the word fuck was used many, 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 many 
especially no fucking way was yeah, yeah. A, was you know something that that we said a lot like no fucking way yeah yeah like no <laughs> and uh no is a complete sentence yeah, no yeah. fucking way is a really complete <laughs> sentence and i refuse to do that and then yeah. again we would all have these lines in the sand and then very quickly realize as you do in this process that if you ain't paying for it and yet you, you know you gotta yeah. there's a bend that needs to be in the trees somewhere and you usually are the one that come out bent and right. broken a little bit. When you were testing it, so we often test movies that are finished just to see how audiences will react so we know if it's working or not, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. te- like, were you testing it often? Did you just test it? No, a no, we, okay. it, it worked. I okay. mean, it worked. Yeah. It worked. Yeah. And, but still, you know, when you test it and it works and it seems great on that level comes the other components of marketing, which are just, and I'm skipping over a lot of the day-to-day grind of all this stuff, but it's just about, you have to decide on your poster image. You have to, you yeah. know, decide on what, how you're selling it. This is a time pre-social media. So, you know, it's a combination of print ads and television spots and cutting things for an audience that you're kind of targeting and aiming for. And Bob was kind of, quite known for sort of hunkering down in his office and kind of looking at all these numbers and data. And Mark Gill was the head Mm. of uh, distribution at the time, marketing. David Lindy was there. Um, It was a really great team of really smart people. But again, we were making something that wasn't in the culture at the right. moment. So right. it could look like it's a very small world of people that would come and see this. And how do we get other people to understand what this is? And that's where the title change came because we kept Scary Movie for a really long time. And then towards the end of all of this, Bob was the one that said Scream and December 21st. And we were like, <sighs> what are you even talking about? <laughs> Christmas? I mean, this is what? I mean, we were, you know, and again, like, because it just sounded so silly because on the surface, everything about this, there was nobody puts horror movies out at Christmas. Like, first of all, there weren't any horror movies out. And at Christmas, like four days before Christmas, like when everybody's buying presents and having a, you know, jolly old time and decorating trees, we're going to, We were really upset about it. Like we were panicking, we were challenging, we were desperately trying to advocate that he reconsider this idea. This is where I have to give, you know, Bob some credit because I do think there became this word that then the the industry kind of capitalized on called counter programming. Yeah. Oh, you guys, you know, so it's sort of, it was sort of like, Ooh, counter programming. We're like counter programming. It's like, what is that? (laughs) You know? Yeah. Oh, there's this and it's romantic. There's nothing else like this out there. And it's funny because usually people, when you say there's nothing else out there like this, that's when all the studios say, and that's why there never will be because we need something that is like this because we feel more comfortable when things are like something we know. Mm -hmm. And we don't like it when we don't know. And so the maverick part of Bob and Harvey, when it worked, it worked if there was solid rationale behind it to some extent. And so that was a play. It was a play. It was really risky. It was kind of the pulling together of the idea of the Edward Munch painting in the scream mask and the ghost face and and what Mm. scream meant Mm. and how to kind of sell that idea and put it at Christmas for all the kids, all the teens who don't want to sit around and decorate Christmas trees and eat popcorn with their grandparents. And they want a place to go and a place to be and a place that they can see themselves and whatever angst they're going through in their family and their love life and a place to release. This became that magic bullet but it took a minute right like it was oh, yeah, like it took, an immediate yeah. smash it took but then it just well like, i mean and then and, and so kind of the final kind of sort of you suck blow which was just like you guys you were living in your own fantasy world was when the trades came out and obviously they reviewed the movie and i will not ever forget the headline of that which was dead on <gasps> arrival 
And they basically said, nobody's ever going to see this and what a piece of shit. And we were coming out against, I, I only remember one of the movies we, we were coming out against because a friend of mine had been very involved with that. And that was a Fox film called One Fine Day with um, yes. Michelle Pfeiffer and George and Clooney. George Clooney yeah. And it was kind of a classic movie that was getting made at the time with big movie stars mm -hmm. and beautiful people and light on its feet and kind yeah. of, you know, mm -hmm. a two-hander, mm -hmm. you know, rom-com kind of thing. Perfect for Christmas, you know, <laughs> when you're shopping and you want a little champagne yeah, fun. Yes. And and just so happens on that particular Christmas, my friend Carla Hacken, who worked at Fox, she had invited me and several of our friends. Her parents had a house in Telluride and we were going to all go skiing. So, you know, again, we didn't have the data or the accessibility that we do now online mm -hmm. to read things ourselves. So you were very dependent on this hidden system of a fax machine spitting out these very, very top secret numbers <laughs> about about your grosses. And they yeah. were like handwritten and only certain people got them. And you were just like, did you get the grosses? Did you? <laughs> you know, it's just all very like so old school. Yeah. Everything's on paper. Yeah. You're waiting. And have you heard? And did you get the call? Who got the call? And, you know, oh, yeah, you were just it. hanging on the edge yeah. of your seat for information that very few people had. Yeah. And so we were dead on arrival. We were in Telluride. We're skiing. And I was, you know, it was kind of depressing, of course. One fine day, one the weekend. And... Mm -hmm. We were like fourth or, I don't even, yeah, fourth or something, and um, maybe not even. And it was sad, and everybody's like, oh, we're so sorry, Kathy, you know, it's too bad. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's too bad, and fuck, you know. Yeah. All right, so everyone was right, and we suck, and gosh, oh, how, how did that, yeah. how did we think we had something so good yeah. and not at the same time? And then the crazy thing happened, which is, when you market a movie at Christmas time, the beauty of any holiday period, the hope is, is that your grosses are really living in the weekday as well as weekends, right, which right. is people typically yeah. when people go to movies. So when you have a lot of people that aren't in school and have free time and it's a two-week break, the hope is, is that your grosses are higher during summer and that's why there's such coveted slots. Yeah. So Christmas obviously was uh, every day you could go to the movies and, um, and what started happening really three or four days into the week after our weekend of shame was <laughs> our weekday numbers were unbelievable. I mean, we were making over a million dollars. You know, we were we wow. were grossing a lot during the week, which right. meant for a very important part of, you know, the marketing of this is word of mouth. And, mm -hmm. you know, now we don't have word of mouth. We have, you know, word of phone, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. word of social media. But really the old school idea of have you seen this, that kind of water cooler boiling moment where people go, oh my God, like I went and saw this movie or, oh my God, somebody dragged yeah. me to this movie and it really, and I loved it. It was catching fire. Oh. And there was a lot of looking at that suddenly and going, oh, wait a minute, there's something here. What's here? Oh. So that was great. Oh. I just like, what an incredible journey. Like I'm exhausted for you. I can't believe we do yeah. this over <laughs> and over and over and over again. <laughs> but, um, yeah. And we still are doing it. What is the thing that like sticks with you? Like what is your legacy? How has it impacted you? And then how do you think it impacted like the whole horror genre just generally? I had never made a film at that point in my career that I would say was a smashing success. Mm -hmm. That was a box office bonanza, whatever yeah. those words get used. And we had always talked about this. Kevin had always seen this as, as one of three. You know, this was always meant mm. to be in mm. his mind. And it was discussed early on, although he didn't, you know, share all the details, but it was, he knew how how he saw this playing out because he was a huge fan of the genre and we all know one of the the tropes and staples of the genre is that it continues you know mm -hmm. the killers never really did right so right, right. you always want to leave room for that this was always conceived as that so with the success of this it became the immediate conversation of making another mm -hmm. and then what would that look like and we have to make it fast and we have to do this quickly so for me i think you know what was fun about this was the chance to experience how to grow a franchise, you know, yeah. how to see and work with people that had experience doing that. 
you know, because that was not something that was in my, you know, in my wheelhouse. I was always just, it was by project dependent. And right. so it was a little bit of a different mindset to think about how mm. you keep something that suddenly is called original when it was called not before, right. original and fresh and evolving so that people can kind of stay with you. And I think that's what's been fun about this, which is just to see the characters grow, the actors grow, the process grow, and then to see it transform as a TV show with MTV, and then to watch what's happened now, how it's been embraced after, you know, I mean, again, with these movies, with any, with any franchise, you know, Star Wars included, everyone will say, oh, the, the fourth one sucked, you know, right. they're never coming back, you know, or this was terrible, and they really went too far this way. And so it's interesting how you can actually pull back and reinvent. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think, you know, this last install was just fantastic. You know, the legacy yeah. of something, how the children of the original characters are carrying the torch now for the sins of the past. Yeah. You know, yeah. so the, the, the lineage yeah. is ongoing. And, and the best movie is... is... <laughs> To the great producers of the film, Marianne Maddalena, who's been my partner for 10 years. Uh, I'm a great friend and a wonderful producer, uh, Kathy uh, Conrad, Kerry Woods. Thank you very much for all of us. Uh, it was a fun picture to make. You couldn't have had a nicer group of people make such a scary film. So thank you very much. So Bex, what an episode, huh? Highs and lows. That's the beauty of these great movies. It's like they could have gone off the tracks in so many ways at so many points but the ones we're choosing to tell are the ones that are ultimately become incredibly successful and we, and we remember what struck you most about her story honestly the resilience and the dedication that she had to just keep going with this because all the roadblocks that she faced from the Weinsteins I love that she just called them the brothers and it felt like at every turn, everything was against her. First, can you imagine going through all the intensity of prep on a movie like this, and then the first few days you're shooting, having the studio say, we hate it, this is terrible, we're coming to set. And the story of, of them, of Bob Weinstein not being happy with the mask and making them have four different masks and then shoot every scene over with each different mask so he could pick which one was his favorite. That's insanity. <laughs> but I think, you know, sort of having been in those moments, you've got to keep your wits about you, but you have to be strong. I mean, many, many people have wilted under the Weinstein gaze. And the thing I loved about Kathy is she was just like, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. And not many people had the strength to do that and you know what she was right and the film worked and she believed in her director and she stuck by him and the film is a success because of it and so again you know just the things you take away from brilliant producers that's the thing that I took away from her is that she's she's a strong strong-willed person and knows when to bend and when to stand up for what's right and so that was that was so incredibly impressive and I think us just having come off of making our first real genre film in this movie, Nanny, that we produced and brought to Sundance. Great tie-in. Um, great tie-in. Which is not a horror film per se, but it has horror elements. It's more of a psychological thriller. But it really was the first time we dealt with, you know, a VFX monster and like horror suspense score and all of that stuff. And so... I thought you had some really good questions for her based on that, on your recent experience, because there are very specific challenges producing a movie in this space that I don't think you really understood before Nanny. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, I think the truth of horror is it doesn't fully come together until the end because horror relies so heavily on sound and visual effects and pacing. And you can't see that in the dailies because it's just, it requires a whole sort of mood that requires layers and layers of work. And so I think they were really pioneers. I mean, I'm sure the Weinsteins were not schooled in making horror, 
at that time, you know, it was just, it was a sort of reinvention of an old genre. And so in a way, I understand why they, they were so dubious of it working. But I think, again, Wes Craven had all the experience in the world. And I love that he was like a very formalist director. He wasn't sort of part of that school of filmmaking at the time, which was a lot of movement and handheld and, you know, sexiness. And he was just like, put it on sticks and shoot it formally, and then we'll sort of pull it all together in the edit. And it really worked. It really, really worked. Yeah, it did feel like the way that they made this movie transcended the traditional horror genre. And I think that's what set it apart from what people expected of the genre. And I think that's pretty incredible that they kind of created something totally new. And that this film didn't work right away, right? It took, it took a couple of weeks for it to catch fire. I love that. Yeah. That it had time. It was a bit of a it was a bit of a slow burn, but then it became an event. And we we talk about that a lot is how do you make something feel like an event that people want to go see? And I think it's harder to do that now because Cappy said in this episode, this was this was before social media. This was this was really truly word of mouth and people did talk about movies. People would tell people to go see movies or hey, let's go see this again. And now I think it's harder to do that because it's so people's attention spans are so limited. They just scroll through things and don't even watch a full trailer. Yeah. But then at the same time, it was harder then to get people to know about your movie. So you did have to rely on it working in theaters and then people talking about it. Yeah. For people who are film fans but might not necessarily know the ins and outs or some of the industry terms, you asked Kathy if this was a spec script. Can you explain what a spec script is? Having been in the business for 20 plus years, my understanding of a spec script is a script that you write without being employed to write it. So it's just something you write on your own and you hope that people will read it and then think you're a good writer and hire you on to other things or, or ultimately make that script. So it's generally done by young writers or writers who have an idea who don't want to go through the trouble of trying to get paid to write it and have faith enough in the idea that it'll get made once it's written. So that was Kevin Williamson's uh, approach, and it obviously worked. I think that was one of those scripts that was sent out that everyone thought was exciting and fresh. And it's very risky for a producer to take a chance on a spec script because there's no chance that, that it'll work or, you know, you have to put money into it with no guarantee of, of getting it back. And so the fact that she saw the potential in this and took the risk on it and then stuck with it all the way through the ups and downs was incredible. And yeah, she created a legacy. She did. I, I find also that spec scripts, you often hear the truest voice of the writer in them because they aren't sort of layered with you know notes from multiple executives or producers so it's it's a good way to understand what a writer's voice really is so that's the value of them i think all right bex this was a fun one this is great i'll see you next week to our audience to our friends out there listening please dm us at stay Gold features at our instagram and if you have movies you want us to sort of do a deep dive into let us know and we want to hear from you thanks for listening mm-hmm.